And now, Signature Dish, a WETA original series. Today on Signature Dish, we're enjoying some European classics. C'est magnifique. We'll get started with a bountiful platter served with a dose of garlic charm. We're gonna add a little bit more tarragon, and voila, ready to go. Then prepare a Sicilian original using an ancient technique. And as you can see, it's really steady, constant heat. I can see it, I can also feel it. <laughs> <laughs> Very hot. And whip up a schnitzel straight from the German woods. All right, I think we got one we can uh, serve up at the restaurant Absolutely. right here. Absolutely. <laughs> Shall we raise our glass? Rose. Cheers to that. I'm Seth Tillman, WETA producer and DC native, and I love good food. That's why I'm traveling to restaurants across the DMV. At each stop, looking for the one thing you just gotta try. That signature dish. Once upon a time, fine dining in Washington was European dining. Regal French restaurants like Rive Gauche, La Salle de Bois, Colony, and Sans Souci towered over the district's dining scene. Other continental fare could be found at restaurants like Roma or the German haunt Old Europe, first opened on Wisconsin Avenue in 1948 and still standing there today. While the D.C. area's upscale culinary offerings have fortunately grown far more diverse, venture around the DMV and you can still find plenty of classic dishes from the old world. That's why I'm first driving up the narrow, winding roads that lead to Great Falls, Virginia. I'm making my way past impossibly huge mansions to visit Le Bair Chez Francois, a sprawling country inn. My folks came over in 1947. My father, Francois, and my mother, Marie Antoinette, he was from Alsace, she was from the Basque country, two opposite extremes. He started as a chef in the Three Musketeers restaurant and then opened Chez Francois, a block from the White House, in 1954. Chez Francois quickly became a popular dining destination and landed on Washingtonian Magazine's inaugural Best Restaurants list in 1968, one of only three restaurants from that original list still in operation today. And Dad always wanted to do a country inn. And he had a property down the road here, and he looked around and he found this place. It was a country store. It was called the Riverbend Country Store. You know, ham hanging from the ceiling and deli sandwiches and all that. So we purchased that in 1972, closed the restaurant downtown in 75, and opened up here in 76. Francois continued to oversee the restaurant into his 90s, as captured in this 2008 WETA documentary. And tonight, we have shrimp bisque, we have the root vegetables puree. And it was his life. Don't have more better. Our joke was, at home, he would say, Mama, hey, can you help me find something? And she'd say, hey, get it yourself. And here, he'd go like this. And easy and 10 people would jump around and say, Monsieur Francois, what can we get for you? Where are you hanging out? And he uh, tasted the sauces every day, went home one evening at 90 plus, uh, fell down and was gone the next day. C'est très beau. I mean, it was a way, a great way for him to, to pass on the legacy. Jacques has continued to build on that legacy, adding a more casual brasserie in the basement and expanding the outdoor garden space, which is where I'm meeting him today. But look, I mean, this is impressive. I mean, look at these. Chef. Seth, hey. how are you? Great to see you. <laughs> Great to see Welcome you Welcome well. to L'Auberge Chez Francois, and one of my favorite uh, things to do here is the gardening. Oh, it's beautiful. We, we love it here. Uh, Stephanie is the lead gardener make sure everything gets done and everything's planted at the right time. We get something almost year round. You know, this is part of France, so the climate's a little different here. <laughs> I, felt, I felt like I traveled somewhere very yeah, far away. Right. And we're today picking haricot vert, slender red green beans, which is an integral part of our signature dish, the Chateaubriand. But it's just wonderful to come out here and pick something and take it right in the kitchen. 
C'est magnifique. <laughs> well, I can't, I can't wait to see what that adds to the Chateaubriand. Should we uh, head back to the kitchen and I'll, I'll watch you work your magic? I wish you would. Come on back. <laughs> can't wait to show you the inside as well. We've tried to create, we have, I believe, an authentic Alsatian look and feel and cuisine. We've been here a long time, 45 years, so <laughs> seems to be working. Seth, welcome to the Lobert Chez Francois kitchen. I want to show you how to make a Chateaubriand. Probably our most favorite dish, a romantic dish. Something for two. Let me make sure my eyes is nice and adequately sharp. Adequately ready to go here. So it's the center cut. So you can probably get two out of a nice size beef tenderloin. The beef tenderloin is very little fat. Uh, and what I like to do is, is cut it, put cracked peppercorns on the meat, and we're gonna sear it first, and then roast it in the oven. Take Takes about in. 20 minutes or so, 20, 22 minutes for a, a medium rare. Well, I do like medium rare for sure. You shall have it. You can always cook it more, you can't <laughs> cook it less. That's can't the under. thing. Freddie here, we're gonna roast this. Medium rare, please. All right. And here are the garnishes. A Chateaubriand comes with a bouquetier, as we say in France, of vegetables. Uh, many from the garden. So what we try to do is prepare them separately because each one has a different flavor profile and needs a little bit of different seasoning. And it is served with a bayonet sauce. I'm gonna taste the sauce. I'm gonna add a little bit more tarragon. And voila, ready to go. Freddie, can I have the uh, medium rare Chateaubriand, please? Ready. Ready to go. Oh, you can see it has a nice crust on it. So you're gonna slice this? I'm gonna slice it, but I've gotta wait at least 10, 12 minutes to slice it. So we'll let it rest. We're gonna usually make six nice uh, slices out of this against the grain. Then I'm gonna put it on the platter and then add all the garnishes around it. And that will go under the broiler or in the hot oven for three or four minutes just to warm everything back up. And then we'll send it out and enjoy it with our bayonet sauce. Seth, here we are. We have Tommy's gonna bring out the chateau and serve it. We always serve it table side. Wow, it really is all about presentation, Chef, isn't it? It is, and all the uh, fresh vegetables from the garden. Thanks for helping <laughs> me pick them. I know you worked up an appetite. But while Tommy's dishing out uh, the chateau, we ought to have a glass of bubbly. Oh, French of tradition. Oh, oh, oh. that sound. <laughs> oh. The best, the best in the West. By in the old days, they'd even carve it out here. That's when the maitre d's were running the restaurant, and when the chefs took over. It, it sort of changed the dynamics where we didn't want the maitre d's and the waiters messing with our food too very much. <laughs> The final step is to put the uh, Bernays sauce on the plate, the tarragon yeah. right from the garden. And before we start, cheers, Seth. Great to have you. Cheers, Chef. Bon appétit. Bon appétit, thank you. Mmm, delicious. <laughs> Please enjoy. Chef, that is so good. I'm glad you're enjoying that it. That nice peppery crust on the outside. And you know, for such a lean cut of meat, it's retained so much of its juiciness. As long on the as inside. you cook it right, as long as you let it rest a bit and cook it right. Plus it's great quality, I mean, you know, top of the line. All right, I'm gonna take a bite of these green beans as well. They're fresh right out of the garden. Mmm. A little crispness, nothing beats going right out to the garden and, and picking it and serving it that day. That's the epitome. So you guys have been open now for almost 70 years. What's the secret? This is what we do here. We we emphasize the classics. You know what you're going to get when you come out to La Bay. We tr Well, Papa's motto was uh, a nice ambiance, a good service, and uh, good food at a reasonable price. Food brings everyone together. And I hate to call it nostalgia. It's a, just an experience that they thoroughly enjoyed and want to celebrate again. Let's put it that way. Well, it was absolutely delicious. Thank you for showing me the garden space and everything else. And I uh, look forward to coming back. We appreciate having you. Cheers. Cheers. A votre santé. That means to your health. <laughs> I'll drink to that.
After winding my way back to DC, I'm heading to Penn Quarter's City Center DC development to visit Piccolina and get a taste of rustic Italian cooking. I grew up in Arlington, Virginia, and as far as Italian cooking, I love to cook pasta with my mom and always loved basil and tomatoes and things like that. I worked in a number of Italian restaurants in Washington. I felt it was really important for me as a woman chef so that I could be successful in industry to create my own space so that I could make my own decisions. Chef Amy opened her own restaurant, Centralina, to immediate acclaim in 2015, focused on light, modern interpretations of Italian classics. Three years later, she opened a more casual space across the street. Piccolina to me is really like my passion project. It seems to me like the truest, most simplest expression of, of Italian food. And I've always wanted to kind of work on bread. Likewise, I love wood-fired cooking, so I felt like the best way to, to accomplish all those things was to, you know, install a really incredibly large wood-fired oven and have the bread and have it all be this like marriage of beautiful ingredients. Picolina by design is all built around wood, basically. So everything that you get at Picolina is cooked in our wood-burning oven. So that's eggs, that's sausage, that's soup. We make soup in, in the wood-burning oven, um, jam. We don't have another method of cooking. I was really excited about going back in time and kind of doing everything the way it was done a very long time ago and, you know, with all that soul to it. Chef. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm always in the mood for great Italian food. But what are you uh, what are you preparing today? Today we're going to make scotchi, which is our signature dish at Piccolina. Scotchi. I can't say I'm actually familiar with that. So this is something I discovered from Sicily. It's actually from the town of Ragusa, and it is um, their signature dish. So it's a very thin rolled uh, sheet of dough, and it's layered with ingredients. Well, a signature dish all the way from Sicily. I can appreciate that. So how do you get started here? So this is a dough made out of flour, olive oil, uh, yeast, and, and water. And then we're just going to go about um, rolling it out. And, and as you can see, there's a lot of olive oil in it and water, which makes it really um, flexible and pliable. You can also see the little air bubbles. That's the yeast doing its thing. So the idea is here is we want to get it as thin as possible. And then it's going to be rolled over and over again. So when you do that, it creates layers of flaky pastry. So this is not going to be a, a doughy pastry. This is going to have nope. a nice sort of crackly This feel is going to be it. crackly and crispy and as light as a stuffed pizza-esque dish can be. So we're just going to make it into kind of a perfect rectangle. And we're going to put a little semolina flour on it. Basically, what you're going to do is take a little bit of tomato sauce. And then we're going to add broccoli rabe, salt and pepper. This is fennel sausage, so you're gonna put it in raw. Okay. And then in the oven, you know, it'll cook the rest of the way. And we have mozzarella. It is looking quite pizza-y at the moment. It is. Okay, so here we have cacio cavolo here. A little bit of basil, a little oregano, and then we're gonna fold it over. Now, the good thing about this pastry is, is that it can be messy and still be delicious. All so right. all the raggedy edges that aren't perfect end up becoming crispy, or there's a hole, like the mozzarella will shoot through it, and it's all good. Caramelizing so. outside, <laughs> it's just an so, explosion of flavor. Yeah, exactly. It's meant to be imperfect. So the second layer, put a little bit more mozzarella. I put a little hot pepper, and then we're going to roll it over again. Tamp it down. One more layer of flavor. Yeah, this one's going to get all the works. And then, you know, you want to take it easy with the sauce because that's going to end up making it soggy, so we don't want that. Still keep that crackly crust. Yeah, all exactly. Right. I like the idea of just folding these flavors on each other, making yeah. these little pockets. So somebody called it a a fancy hot pocket, and you know, I mean, listen, it's not my. Hey, hot pockets are it's delicious. It's not my best, uh, you know, it's not the best description, but it works. Okay, and then this is the final layer. Just cut it. You want to seal off the edges. That's it. So I'm gonna flour up the pizza peel, and now we're gonna put it on the peel. So why don't we walk this way, and I'll show you how to put it in the wood oven. Sounds great. Let's do it, chef. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> there is a lot of heat coming off this oven. What is yes. this thing? So this is a uh, huge wood-fired oven. And as you can see, it's really steady, constant heat. I can see it. I can also feel it. <laughs> Very um, hot. Yeah. This is definitely not for the fan of heart. <laughs> it's definitely not for me either. <laughs> I definitely wouldn't be able to do this. In terms of the way that it cooks, it has a dry method of, of cooking. So instead of a traditional oven with gas where you have a closed door, this takes the moisture and humidity out. So it's not going to steam as much. You'll get that nice kind of crack. More caramelization. Caramelization yeah, is always good. Whether it's a piece good. of fish or a pizza or, yeah. Got it, got it. We always want to position the, the logs in the corner so that you have good air circulation. And you want the air kind of circulating yeah. across the top yeah, of the oven. Will. Just like, okay, so okay. it's kind of like a piece oven in that sense. Oh, yeah. All right, so now that these are caught, we're going to put the scotch in the oven. So we're just putting it right on the deck. It's going to take about, I'd say, somewhere between five and five and ten minutes till all the layers are cooked inside. And then we're going to turn it like one or two times to get it crispy all the way around. Wow, chef, this looks terrific. Glad we could come to a maybe My cooler pleasure. spot to, uh, to dig in. Um, so how do you even get started on something like this? Fork and knife. Oh, look yeah. at that melty cheese. Help yourself. There we go. Oh, I could even hear when you were cutting it. I could hear the crackle. Mm. Mm. Wow, chef, that is fantastic. <laughs> my uh, my frame of reference is a calzone. I've had so many doughy calzones in my mm -hmm. day, but it almost has that like yeah that flatbread that cracker like consistency on the outside. That's really terrific. Thank you. I like the broccoli rob. You know, I'm not always a, a broccoli rob fan, but just that little bit of bitterness that mm -hmm. it gives to it is really nice. Punctuates the other flavors. So uh, is this the uh, the Sicilian way of making scotch? There are so many different ways that they prepare this in Ragusa, the home of the scotchy. You know, so this is sort of a more traditional, like Neapolitan pizza-esque flavor going on here. You know, unlike a pizza, you could just pick this up and eat it as you're walking down the street. You could definitely pick it up and walk right out the door and keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and I see all this other beautiful bread. Yes, this picolino was meant to be a project around bread and all kinds of different doughs. So everything's handcrafted. The bread is made in house. And, you know, I really wanted to have a beautiful, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner spot that people could feel relaxed in and enjoy, like, really terrific food um, without fuss. That's it. Well, I love it. And this was delicious. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm finishing up way, way outside of the district, just shy of the Chesapeake Bay in Edgewater, Maryland. I'm paying a visit to the Old Stein Inn, a venerable German institution. In 1983, my father and mother, Carl and Ursula Selinger from Rhineland Pfalz in Germany, decided to open up the Old Stein Inn in Edgewater, Maryland. Like any American immigrant coming to the country, they wanted to bring what they brought from home. They wanted to bring their food. They wanted to bring their traditions to this area. So in 2010, we unfortunately had a very serious fire. We had closed for almost 10 months and the support of the community was really what kept us going. People emailed, called, and told us how much they had uh, missed us and they wanted us back, and it was a blessing in disguise. We came back with a better restaurant, and we're still here after 39 years. Germany is a pretty small country, but we have the ocean on the uh, northern, and we have the mountains in the south, so it's all about, like, um, bringing everything together and just trying to do the best out of it. It's coming from the soul, from the heart, you know, to cook German cuisine. It's like a family restaurant and everybody loves to come in here and it's like a generation for generation stuff going on, you know. The parents teach their kids, that is a schnitzel, that is the spätzle. So they all come here and I will do my best to make that never end. 
Chef. Nice to meet you. Hello, Seth. Very nice to meet you. It smells great in this kitchen. Uh, what are you making today? I'm going to show you today how to make like a traditional German Jäger schnitzel. Well, I've had plenty of schnitzel before, but I don't know about Jäger schnitzel. Uh, what is that? Well, the Jäger schnitzel means like uh, the hunter schnitzel. You go in the forest and shoot some deer or wild boar. You use like the bones and everything to make a demi glass and uh, the fresh ingredients like the herbs, uh, the mushrooms, some cream from your cows. All right, so this is just a rustic kind of country German dish right here? Yes, it absolutely is. So how do you get started here? I will turn uh, on the fire now and put in some butter, you know. Butter is like the most important thing in German kitchen. Then you add some seasonal mushrooms some onions, add a little bit more butter on it. Butter is always good for you. <laughs> I love butter. So you will add some pepper, some salt. I'm so sorry the hood is coming on, you know, but it's a kitchen right we're, we're, here. We're cooking, we're cooking. So then you have your demi-glass. Uh, I can tell how nicely reduced that stock is. It's already so syrupy in this pan right here. It is. And the demi glass takes like really two days to cook this. Really let those flavors get nice and concentrated. Absolutely. And then you add like the herbs. You can add like oregano, add rosemary, some uh, chives, you know, to make it look uh, nice. And um, then beside the butter, very important in the German kitchen, you will add some uh, heavy cream. Of course. And at the end, bring it to a uh, boil. So, says that that's your whole deal about the Jäger sauce. Now, if you don't mind, we go over there and beat up some schnitzels. <laughs> beat up some schnitzel, all right. Uh, so is this pork right here? Yeah, it's pork tenderloin. We just have to give some salt and pepper on it on both sides, and then we have to beat it up a little bit. You want that nice kind of uniform uh, thickness throughout, nice yeah, and thin. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, ha it has to uh, be a schnitzel and not a steak. So in the old days for the Jaeger schnitzel, I mean, they'd be going into the forest to hunt for the boars to make this dish, right? Oh yeah, absolutely they did. You know, I mean, uh, back in the days, uh, we didn't have porks and pigs and cows at home, so we just went to the forest. That's how we created the word Jaeger schnitzel. But by now, I'm glad I can buy it and uh, <laughs> don't have any extra hours to go in the forest at night. Save you a trip, that's nice. Absolutely, um, yeah. So how do, you, uh, how do you pound this thing in? You, you just start on one side, turn it around. You are not messing around. So in Germany, we say you beat it down from $9 to $18, <laughs> you know, the size. All right, says you saw how I did it, so maybe you want to give it uh, a shot. Here's the All hammer, right. just uh, go and do it. Hammer of Thor, all right, so we're gonna use the uh, the flat side here? Yes, you do the flat side, right, just well. do, the, do it. I'll go to town on it. Oh boy. Good stress relief right here. Yeah, absolutely it is. I haven't gotten it quite to $18 yet. I got a few more few more uh, strikes to go here. My boss is not paying you the extra hours until you finish, but you're doing just fine. All right, I think we got right. one we can uh, serve up at the restaurant Absolutely. right here. Absolutely. <laughs> the last step is like to bread it. You want to put it in flour, sweep it off, put it in egg, and then you put it in uh, the uh, Japanese panko breadcrumbs, and then we are ready to cook it. So the next step is cooking the schnitzel in butter and oil. And you will cook it for like four minutes and flip it around. The next step you do is do the side dishes. The red cabbage is basically caramelized sugar and salt. And the spätzle is like every noodle. You just have uh, eggs, flour and water. So after we plate it, the final step is ladle the Jäger sauce on the schnitzel. 
and then we will sprinkle on our garnishes. And then we will be all set. Mike, Dirk, thank you so much for letting me come back into the kitchen. This looks incredible, but and you guys are not messing around with this beer here. Oh, we're so happy to have you, uh, Seth. We definitely don't mess around with German beers. We source uh, great beers from Germany, beers you won't get anywhere else. Well, cheers to that. Or I should Prost. say, Prost. <laughs> Is a German way of saying Prost. it. Prost. 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 Finally, Prost. Let's drink. Oh, good. I know the, sch the schnitzel is going to be a perfect accompaniment to that. Oh, let's dig in. All right. <sighs> Got to make sure I get some of that Good. sauce in yep. this first bite, too. Oh, Dirk does a great job. What do you think? That is delicious. That sauce, it's got such a nice richness, and the mushrooms are so perfectly cooked. That's really wonderful. Thank you, sir. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. I like with the panko that you're able to get that nice, crispy crust but it still stays so nice and juicy and flavorful on the inside. Why I put the sauce in the middle is that you can have a look always on the crust, on the panko, you have like a mix of the texture of uh, the sauce in the middle and the uh, crusty, crunchy panko with the really tender cooked meat. What are some of these uh, other sides that go with it? Well, it's like uh, the Spätzle, it's like the German kind of noodles. And of course, the red cabbage, you know, the most uh, famous uh, side dish uh, in Germany. Next to sauerkraut. Next to sauerkraut. It's like a, a family secret, so I can't tell the recipe. <laughs> I just love also the hearty portions, the beer, this plate of Jaeger schnitzel, this giant pretzel. I just like how you guys aren't skimping on the experience here. Right, that's actually, we have a German word for it. It's called Gemütlichkeit, which means a comfortable, homey place that you bring family and friends, and that's what we're about at the old sign-in. Glad you got to experience it. So. It's Oktoberfest every day. Well, um, thank you guys again. Uh, shall we raise our glass? Absolutely. Ein Prosit, ein Prosit, Der Gemütlichkeit. Ein Prosit, ein Prosit, der Gemütlichkeit. Prost to that. Prost. Cheers to that. But now you have to drink it all. <laughs>